societies that are particularly vulnerable to this kind of extremism are those founded on closed ideological systems that redefine morality and ethics. We have seen a variety of such societies in modern times. Nazi Germany and the Stalinist Soviet Union are but examples. However, let us not forget that religious societies are no exceptions to this perversity. As Christians, we need to remember that we too have generated such extremist ideologies upon which entire societies have been founded. I could point here to crusader and inquisition mentality in medieval times, military and aggressive colonialism in places considered the new world, and even religiously justified warfare in modern times conducted in places like Croatia, Serbia, or closer to home, Lebanon. Thanks be to God, today, most of us would feel uncomfortable naming such phenomena Christian, but their ideologues certainly had a self-understanding that they were promoting Christian values. Finally, it is interesting that some might see as extremist any insistence on particularity within other religious communities. In my own Catholic community, I ha sometimes hear members of the community point to veiled Muslim women and refer to them as extremists. I have to smile because they seem to be oblivious to the veiled nuns that run our schools and hospitals. Are they not extremists too? By the way, there's one sitting in the audience somewhere, Sister Patricia. I sometimes hear some in my community point out as an extremist, a Jew who will not eat food that is not kosher. But is this more extremist than I myself who refuses to eat meat in Lent? It is important to purge our use of this word so that it does not refer to any opinion or behavior that does not conform to my own religious, cultural, or social ideas and practices. After these long preludes and explanations, we now come to the subject of Jewish extremism. Needless to say, we as Christians in this land would not be hard-pressed to point to Jewish extremism. We can quite easily conjure up images of armed settlers going on the rampage against people and property. Radicals who seek to burn mosques and churches. Demagogues who spout hatred of non-Jews. Fanatical nationalists who ignore the rights of others and the respect due to them. Jewish extremism is alive and well. Perhaps we should cautiously add that in modern times, the adjective Jewish refers to two distinct references, Jewish religion and Jewish nationalism. These two are not contradictory, but they are distinct. One is based upon an ancient system of practice and faith, whereas the other is based upon a relatively modern ideology of nationalism. Within the religious systems of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, extremism might indeed set down roots because of the belief in the community that one is chosen by God to propagate the only true faith. These ancient religions are not democratic, egalitarian, and dialogic by nature, but rather are convinced that they possess a truth that is universal, and that all would be better off either belonging to my community or at least recognizing its superiority. God is on my side. Judaism is not unique here. This conviction that Jews are chosen by God and somewhat better off than others has been sharpened 
by centuries of living on the margins of the mainstream as a small community, often suffering for its religious fidelity. When it comes to modern Jewish nationalism, Zionism has produced forms of extremism that are well known in the development of modern nationalist ideology, ethnocentric, exclusivist, and incompatible with democracy and equality. Nationalist ideology in general is highly problematic with regard to equality and freedom, especially in multi-ethnic, religiously diverse societies. When this is coupled with the promotion of bringing new populations into territories defined as the national homeland and the exclusion of native populations from full rights, then the problem is intensified. In the context of the settlement of Palestine, defined by Zionism as the land of Israel, the promotion of Jewish migration, the acquisition by sale, conquest, or confiscation of land redeemed for the Jewish people, redeemed, you need to look at my hands to understand that I'm using a particular vocabulary that might not be my own. The establishment of sovereignty in a state defined as Jewish, the language used is highly problematic. This has undoubtedly been strongly influenced by a certain Jewish understanding of history, which presents the Jews as victim in the centuries of diaspora existence, a reality of suffering that peaked in the middle of the 20th century with the Shoah. According to this understanding, Zionism must create a domain in which Jews dominate and define the space of their existence according to Jewish values and Jewish interests often to the exclusion of those defined as non-Jews. Violent Palestinian resistance to Zionism has indeed intensified the conflict. It is perhaps useful to remember in this context that Jewish nationalism only won the heart and soul of the Jewish people as a whole after the Shoah. Until then, Jews were divided between Zionists who saw the migration to Palestine as the only way for Jews to survive and the non or anti-Zionists who promoted the idea that Jews should seek emancipation and equality among the nations among whom they lived. Jews have intimately known the experience of exclusion marginalization, and even persecution. Before the Second World War, many, if not most, religious Jews were part of those who rejected Zionism. They saw Zionism as a kind of assimilation and loss of religious identity. The proposition that the Jews should become a nation like any other. Furthermore, they saw the diaspora as a vocation, a mission, and an identity that was willed by God. The Shoah almost completely silenced those who had rejected the idea of the establishment of an ethnocentric state in Palestine. But their voice was never totally extinguished and is being heard again in the light of what is happening in Israel-Palestine today, abhorrent to some Jews. After the Second World War, the Zionists were not only successful in convincing most Jews that it was necessary for survival to create a Jewish homeland in Palestine, defined now as the ancestral homeland, but they were able to convince much of the international community that recognizing the Jewish claim on the land was a way to correct an historical injustice as well as to make amends for what Jews had suffered. Their language was most successful among many Christians because of the supposed biblical echoes which Christians, especially 
Bible-rooted ones could identify with. Extremism, already present in the early forms of Zionism and empowered with the creation of the State of Israel, promoted the expulsion of the Palestinian Arabs from their homeland. After the 1967 war, new forms of Zionism emerged that celebrated the conquest of the biblical heartland, Hebron, Bethlehem, Nablus, and many other sites that evoked the biblical story of Israel. It was in this period that religious Zionism became a potent force in spawning extremism, and out of this blend of religion and nationalism was born the settler movement, and on its fringes, an even more toxic extremism that manifests itself with such self-assurance today. Nationalism, ethnocentric, exclusivist, and discriminatory, is all the more toxic when it speaks a language that has mobilized God. I would stress that we are not really dealing with a phenomenon that is uniquely Jewish, but rather shares many elements with other ideologies that blend human exclusivism with divine approval. What is mind-boggling is that Jews who have known exclusion and discrimination over centuries can adopt ideologies whose language echoes that of their worst enemies. However, a gospel response cannot limit itself to pointing a finger at the acts and consequences of Jewish extremism, naming them and analyzing them. Academics and journalists can do that far more convincingly. Rather, Christians, in addition to trying to penetrate the heart of this phenomenon in order to combat it, must also proclaim good news, this being a conscious alternative to extremism. A gospel response to Jewish extremism within a holy land that continues to bleed daily is to consciously enunciate the Christian alternative to extremism, a path that has not always been taken by Christians. Christians in facing extremism must emerge from paralyzing fear to activist faith. Christians, after all, are named for their master who did not promise a bed of roses. Christ said to his followers, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. These are words that have guided generations of Christians who have laid down their lives in faithful witness to the gospel. It is perfectly understandable that many Holy Land Christians balk at the challenge, preferring to guarantee a better future for their children in a world that seems more secure in Europe, the United States, or Australia. However, those that inspire by their courage, determination, and faith are the ones who, despite everything, stay in their ancestral homeland because they know that it is their vocation and mission to bear witness to Christ in the land that is his. They have put their hand to the plow and do not look back. Furthermore, a gospel response does not allow disciples of Christ to isolate themselves behind denominational walls and inside a safe Christian space. Faith is a sure way beyond fear and isolation to openness and service, seeking Christ and following him as he goes out in ever widening circles within society at large. Christians must go out in order to find all those who are similarly menaced by extremism 
and who share a vision of a society that is free and open, overcoming fear and its offspring, isolation, takes Christians out of any kind of self-imposed ghetto, confident in the liberating energy of the spirit, Christians seek out those within the larger society similarly threatened by monolithic extremist visions. Fear might forge the belief that we are alone and isolated, but if we go out, we will surely discover those that are too afraid to walk alone and whom can be invigorated by the same spirit. Faith, which characterizes a gospel vision, is the deep-rooted sense that the victory has already been won in the resurrection, and that no matter what crosses are encountered on the way, extremism, hatred, and rejection, the forces of death have been overcome in Christ's cross, and life reigns supreme the gospel response to Jewish extremism and Muslim extremism for that matter is rooted in two types of engagement with society at large. One, formulating gospel discourse and two, building institutions that witness to the gospel. Gospel discourse must distinguish the disciple of Christ as a voice for justice, peace, pardon, reconciliation, and beyond all else, selfless love. Fear often provokes the development of a discourse that is reactive and insular, closing Christians off from their neighbors, speaking a language that echoes the language of those they fear. However, the gospel language spoken by Christians opens them up to others with whom they share their daily lives. Instead of us and them, gospel language works on making the I and the you a transfigured we. Building a community in which walls are progressively eliminated. Faced with Jewish and Muslim extremism, the Christian is called to discern, making distinctions between extremism and those who are friends, neighbors, compatriots, between extremism and those manipulated by the extremists. However, even the extremists themselves are not beyond these ever-widening circles of dialogue and relationship as Christians even call them to take responsibility for the consequences of their words and actions. Gospel discourse is rooted in humility and self-criticism. We have been there, we have done that, and we know that it leads to death. However, gospel discourse points to a kingdom that Christians believe is already here, even if it is not yet manifest. This is a kingdom in which resurrection has vanquished death and all that feeds into it, contempt, hatred, violence. Let every word we speak bear witness to this, radiating a kingdom that we know is here and coming. Our discourse materializes in Christian institutions which are at the service of all. Christian institutions throughout the Holy Land, particularly our schools, our colleges, our universities and hospitals are places where all members of society not only rub shoulders, but where relationships are established and discourse on diversity and respect is developed. It is through these institutions that Christians can and do leave their mark on society, providing a stark contrast to ethnocentric nationalism 
and religious fanaticism. These institutions must be preserved, supported, and cultivated, for they are a shining counterexample to what is proposed by the extremists. Our institutions must be good news, new in their radical openness to all. Indeed, when one builds a house, one constructs walls that enclose a safe place. When that world is dark and threatening, full of extremists who teach hatred, we might invest special attention in building the doors that can be firmly sealed. However, when one builds the kingdom of God, one pulls down the walls to make sure that no one is left outside. The Christian presence in Israel, Palestine, and throughout the Middle East is not and will not be measured by its statistical importance, but rather by the significance of its contribution to society, particularly in its gospel language of love and its service of society, education, health, and welfare. Christians cannot retreat into a ghetto comfort zone, but are called to engage alongside all those who are working for an open society. I would like to conclude this talk with the words of a 2014 statement of the Catholic Holy Land Commission for Justice and Peace. For those who that's, this might add something, it's a commission headed by Sayyidna Michel Sabah. Our role as religious leaders is to speak a prophetic language that reveals the alternatives beyond the cycle of hatred and violence. This language refuses to attribute the status of any enemy to any of God's children. It is a language that opens up the possibility of seeing each one as brother or as sister. Pope Francis, in the 2014 Invocation for Peace, cried out, We have heard a summons, and we must respond. It is the summons to break the spiral of hatred and violence, and to break it by one word alone, the word brother. But to be able to utter this word, we have to lift our eyes to heaven and acknowledge one another as children of one father. Religious leaders are invited to use language responsibly so that it becomes a tool to transform the world from a wilderness of darkness and death into a flourishing garden of life. Thank you.